right. Okay, so I'm successfully sharing the screen. Um, uh, remote people, especially Margaret, who's furthest away, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Brilliant, and we can hear you when yes. you your mic. That's brilliant. Thank you. Well, we might actually be. Let's hope. Okay. So welcome to physical and remote participants. Uh, this was put together in something of a hurry, but um, on the other hand, it's things I've been meaning to share with you for a while. And in a way, it continues my first talk on, um, on rich tomography generally. And I'm going to focus on the two-dimensional problem here and, and what we know about it. And I mean, so for the more theoretical ones, you will see this is really kind of watered down. This is an attempt to explain things to practitioners. Um, and uh, I mean, you might, I feel free to butt in if um, you don't understand my notation or you disagree with me or whatever. But I'm, I'm trying to explain it so that people can use it. Okay, so first of all, and this is a recap, the transverse and longitudinal ray transform are symmetric tensor fields, and and let's just take a rank T tensor field that it works for any, so it generalizes to vectors and higher rank tensors as well. But we'll stick to the rank T case, really just uh, to, to make it slimmer in rotation, and because the extension is fairly easy to see. So the MRT, longitudinal rate transform, we go along a line. So our line is parameterized by one point it goes to X. So in, in many systems, this corresponds to a screen, pixel coordinates on the screen. Eh? And of course, you, you can just choose the X on, on a plane in terms of dictate the direction you're going. So the direction you're going, the ray direction is the psi, that's a unit vector. And so X plus T psi goes along that line. Okay? And you can choose any convenient place to put the X in, but we generally get that pixel coordinates. And so what we've done is we've got a tensor with two indices and contracted it with the unit vector in the direction we're going, giving a scale, right? So in other words, it's like if it was a matrix, we do vector transpose matrix that can get scalar. Okay. So interestingly, that gives us a uh, scalar. In general, the transverse ray transform does in some sense the opposite. And, and actually, there's a number of other things that would one could define in a similar way. These are perhaps the most obvious ones in the papers. In this case, what we do is project on the component perpendicular to the direction we're going. And, and that gives, in, in three dimensions, that would give a two dimensional plane that we're projecting on. So we'd have more components, it wouldn't be a scalar generally. Um, so this contraction just removes the components in that direction. Let's just look at that in a little bit more detail in a moment. But first to say, if you were implementing this, and the, the point is we saw in the hackathon that we often have code that implements the extra transform for a scalar, which is, um, is very efficient and uses GPU acceleration and so on. And um, then it likes to integrate scalars along lines in three dimensions or two dimensions, where the scales are represented on a box or grid. Um, and so actually it is possible to, to take all the stuff from the size and outside, right? So actually you can get your tensor, how big that is, but components in Fluxel, get each component with the forward projector separately, even on different sheets, that learn different cores, right? And then do this projection stuff afterwards. So that's kind of quite interesting for a computational point of view. It's not necessarily the best way to do it, but it's a convenient path to do the, the forward solve if, if you have that available. And then, yeah, so you project all the components and uh, along the ray, and then you do the projection of the tensors that you get from that onto the direction you're going or the direction that you're going. And that has to be done for each parallel beta projection. 
Okay, so just a little bit about that matrix because it may be a little bit clearer in um, matrix form. Um, if you define P psi to be the projection function of the psi, then it's the identity minus the outer product of the unit vector psi. So if you think about it, if you put something into the psi, psi transpose psi, then, then this gives the component in the psi direction and not plus by psi. Um, uh, but then it subtracts it because you've got the identity, right? So it, it's taking away the component in the psi direction. You see it does that. Um, to do it to a matrix, you use it on both sides. And of course, the, the psi was just in the z direction. Well, it does it snips off the z, right? Just, um, in, in, in more general directions, it's just got a lot of trick functions in, but you see it's it's um, made that rank deficient matrix. And of course, we we really would be you know adapting our coordinate system perpendicular to the direction we're going, in which case it would have a new form, we wouldn't have to carry around um, the whole of that matrix and so it's zero. Okay, so that, that's what we need for the transverse case. N equals two is a bit weird, and I'm concentrating on N equals two because it is quite useful, even though most problems are three dimensional. It's quite common to collect data plane by plane. But, um, and, and perhaps you just wonder what you can do with, with the data from, from each plane. And um, I think it's very clear that the camera artist, the long single range person, really doesn't care if you restrict it to a plane because the direction you're going is in the plane. But the TRT, the opposite, it's, it's taking a component um, which is only normal to the plane. <laughs> so you kind of repeat the outer lights, and then the thing is, the, the, the other components, it, it makes a mixture depending on, on the end you go. So it's a bit more complicated. Than the but it, anyway, it's still something to make um, So the strange thing about the um, TRT and the LRT in two dimensions is they're more or less the same thing. Because um, uh, if you contract the vector with the perpendicular vector design, there's only one two dimension, one direction, and, um, then that gets the component in that direction. And that's the same as, as doing this J and then just uh, projecting the perpendicular direction. So it's actually only one number of alignment that you measure the same difference. Um, gypsum, the, the LRT and NTRT both give you one number when you try. Right the mountain sensor will give you one number for life. It's, it's interesting. You're not really expecting to get that much more out of it. Um, so so all you do is kind of change the components about you change the variables and we label the components and the LRT and the TRT. And it's kind of the same observation. Okay, some 2D vector calculus, I hope you got it right. And it's kind of neglected because you this vector calculus in 3D and you know, it doesn't quite fit the curl and the vector So, um, so we've got a gradient of the scalar, right? So it's just that's just all you need. But the curl thing is like, um, you know, the rotation of a vector field in the plane just a scale. And, and of course, you, when you're teaching this, you often just say in the plane, you, 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 you have uh, the curl just as a K component, where K is the vector for building to the plane. And then you just use all your other vector calculus. I mean. but, but I mean, you know, that's just sort of pretending that it really is two-dimensional and, and it, it does deserve a little bit of a um, and so that's kind of a curl or what in the sense that the Kenano is great. Um, and of course, there's, there's a point where I feel that you can expect that if the curl is zero, then it is a gradient up to topology. Right? So, uh, so I'm simply connecting things and the words to the extent. Now, the symmetric gradient of one, two, ten, four, which shall be from a full visible field, which, you know, in the context of shall be from a full, like in seven, um, it's the most important operator that, that it deals with, because it deals with all the symmetric tensor fields of any rank. 
And what D does is get any tensor that you like, differentiate it, and then skew symmetrize over it, this average over the symmetry. Um, so it's sort of the opposite of the skew symmetry, which is also called the degenerate tensor. Um, okay, so this is the operator that we see in. Oh, sorry, I can say back to you now. I knew I, knew I still had some bugs in it, and then we should get half an hour there. <laughs> um, yeah, so you take a vector field there and you take its gradient, which is a matrix, and then you symmetrize that matrix by averaging um, this point. Okay. And so if U was a displacement field in mechanics, uh, this would be straight. Thank you. So it, it measures how much something's stretched leaving out this kind of vector. Now the divergence calculation of course delta is um, a minus uh, uh, formal angle reaction, but but it really is just kind of divergence. All you do is whatever test you got, you differentiate it, right? Which would make a bigger tensor, and then you sum over two different indices. Um, in this case, it was a factor that uh, you know, it, it, it goes from symmetric tensors to um, two lower degrees of angle. No, one by one. It goes up by one and down by two. So it goes from twenty tensors to lower. And and so actually it's just a divergence of two columns of a of a matrix. But but it, of course that matrix is symmetric to many symmetrics. And um the notation uh, of anti tensor whose divergence is zero, which means you know, so the matrix of divergence of x is zero, always is called solenoidal. And you want to think of solenoidal with potential in the sense that it's used for example of the magnitude. Um, but, but of course, you know, that involves um, uh, excuse me, So if it's like if it's zero, um, it's called solenoidal. And if it's the symmetric derivative of a lower order thing, it's the vector that is called potential. And on the symmetric connected domain, um, or actually the whole of our end with, with, with the right decay, um, you can write any tensor field as a more formal direct sum of the solenoidal potential part. Um, to make it unique on um, on a domain, you want you at the boundary to be zero. So it's kind of interesting because when you're dealing with strain, where you get symmetric derivative of the displacement field, um, this this doesn't you know so sort of quite work in the sense that you isn't the displacement field unless the displacement has to be zero in the boundary. So so somehow. The part that you know it's not zero in the matrix has to go into the solid one of the and the source of the boundary. So that would be that would be important to us because generally for that LRT, it's a solenoidal part you can find. And then the question is that is that useful? Okay, so the LRT has to be null space. It's in fact everything. Uh, oh, let's see, I've missed the restriction. You restrict the zero um, on the domain or at, on our two inch decay seems to be infinity. Then the LRT, we call I, the human, the LRT of that symmetric group is zero. I mean, actually, what's going on is that. If you if you enter the support of, of the 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 um, the value there, but then you integrate the work. so it just gives you a position between the endpoints. So this is just a fundamental thing that happens. Integrate the bridges and get the endpoints, and if the endpoint is zero, then this is zero. Um, so um, so I, actually, it's a little bit more than that. You know, um, the null space of i is exactly such potential fields, at least um, 
of R2, or um, if you've got a domain, finally, uh, you can have to use this for, well, they say for um, convex and convex domains, but for the two domains, the case, you, still, it, it, you know, they actually remark that um, so because you can use any conformal method, basically any domain that you can conform that to its exterior on the linear scale has this result. So it's just got to be um, simple to make single holes. Then um, what you can all talk about L is uh, exactly the solenoidal part in this sense. Um, and the null space is exactly the potential sense of course. And of course the the TRT JF in two dimensions it's, it's kind of reversed and uh, you know the had a notation for like skew solenoidal or something but um uh, uh you, you can find the potential tensors so uh, there's just the note about the complexity Okay, so I want to dwell on this a little bit because many people I know try to read this couple of pages in the book. And the thing is, he does, he does this total factor that's in the construction formula, but he does it for arbitrary m, the dimension, and arbitrary m, the length of the tensor. And uh, a few years ago, I thought Chris went straight through the case. Of n equals two, it will remain equal to it. Um, so there's quite a lot of notation in here, but, but in this case, it's fairly tame and has quite a lot that we can pull out of it. First of all, um, we get G, which is IF. So that is actually our data. It pretty much looks like sinogram data because it's just one number for each line. Uh, but if you look at it, you'll see it looks rather dodgy from the point of view of sinograms. Um, so you can kind of think, what's wrong with this? So, so uh, it's kind of because it, it will have typically a bit of sinogram like stuff, right? Because if, if the tensor F is some scalar multiple of the identity plus some other stuff, then that scalar multiple here, it's really just a scalar that doesn't depend on which direction you hit it. So you kind of expect to recover that anyway. So let's kind of think through this. Um, so this, this is back projection, but it's back projection to form the higher point of the longitudinal ray transform. And, and so you have to think a little bit how that works, because it has to make a scalar to a matrix, this matrix matrix. Um, as well as back projection. So in other words, at each point, it still has to go the lines, but it, it gives you a symmetric matrix. And that symmetric matrix is just, well, the first one is added by the cost square theta times, times the depth. And the one in the back of diagonal is also the side theta. And the one on the other side of is so in other words, they're, they're weighted out with the, with the angle in there. And we've got square and sign space. So we can see how to try out the positive sign. So, so this is just like back to Jenkins, but it's got those trick weights in it. And then, okay, so th these, these numbers um, are called C0 and C1, which have a rather horrendous formula with Kind of double factorials in and, and things um that you know so you have to evaluate in, ge in general it's kind of a pain to evaluate so three quarters and a quarter but look at this this is just you back project okay with these cost square sine square things and then apart from three quarters all you do is a ramp filter so let me explain uh delta is the passing operator in the play and when it works on tensors i just do it by the time. So it's just elsewhere. But, but of course, when you implement ramp filters in tomography, what you do is take a Fourier transform, multiply it by absolute value of frequency, and then take the inverse Fourier transform, right? With some clipping of the frequency to make it stable. So that's standard filter factor. If you want to do a back project then filter rather than filter then back project, well, that, that works fine. 
it's just you've got to do that for so the two to them. So you do the two people you transform multiply by absolute value the, the, the norm of the frequency vector, right? And because it's to the half, it gives absolute value. Mm -hmm. If I want to pass it, it would be absolute value squared for the frequency. So that actually just says random filter. And you see it's a, it's a square root of differential operator, it's on the smooth link, if you like, it's a random filter. So actually, apart from that projection plus and so we've got band filter and uh, okay, we've got a matrix, this matrix plus squares and such and so on. And what about the other thing? Okay, let's just unpack those. I mean, the, the neat thing about this formula is it directly gives you the solenoidal part. I mean, you can make a simpler formula that where the solenoidal part is wrong, but it's kind of got a random um, potential part added to it. But, Obviously, no relation to the original potential part because it, it can't know that. Um, so, TR is just a trace. Um, it's written as J in Sharif's law for reasons which make very much more sense in general, but for a matrix, it's just a trace. It's some of the diagram. Okay, so now we've got a scalar, right? And then H is a passion matrix. So, it takes a scalar and takes all the second derivatives. Which is a symmetric matrix, right? It's different matrix. Yeah. Uh, Charge which not by itself, it could be squared. And so that's kind of applied to, to the difference of, of what it was before. Um, okay, so maybe to understand this, probably best to think of what happens if it, if it was a scale. I need to kind of talk this through. Right? Perhaps you're doing a little exercise to see if you know what's going on. So, suppose F was a scalar multiple, what do you call it? What do you call it? Alpha, lovely. Okay. I was thinking about it. Is this a magic trick? Think of a letter. Alpha, right? So it's alpha times the identity. Um, and then we, we back project it. And the point is, rather than just back projecting, we've made a matrix with cos squared, cos sine, sine squared in the matrix. But it's still just multiplied by alpha, right? And, uh, you know, it, it's back projected. It, it's, uh, it's back projected along every way, but of course, alpha doesn't change the direction. Of uh, we take the trace, which is cos squared plus sine squared. Mm. That's one. Mm -hmm. So now that remember, I said that you can do the projection afterwards, so we can take that matrix to get out, just take its trace. Okay, so now we've got a maybe what's the last one? Maybe we can look at that constant. <laughs> and then we take the um, the Hessian matrix, and uh, of course, um, this is spatially because we've got a function of x. Now. Um, it's a back projection of alpha. Uh, so we take the second derivative, but um, it was it was just alpha. So um, uh, on the diagonal of that, we've got d two by d d two alpha by d x one squared and d two alpha by d x two squared. And then we take the inverse of plus in that, which I mean the point is the trace of that matrix. Is the Laplacian of alpha? So, so trying to see if getting alpha back. Okay. So, okay, so I haven't done that in full, but but you can see that it's kind of two people in a scalar component. Can you feel how much you Six hours writing this talk, but in a comfy chair, and then we're back there. So I, I need to run around here. Yeah, so um, absolute 
Chat with your thesis why is a frequency variable. So think of it. Um, and then one over y squared divided by transpose. And that could be the base of y by transpose. Yeah, yeah. Because what? Yeah, because then that, yes, that's true. I think, I think that's right. Um, because what we get is we get y i, y j, and y j. Yeah. And then it cancels out. So. Because we, we found the four tensor, and then the table is based on the two tensor. Mm -hmm. Back to check, you know, that's um, B, is what Sharon Fuchs calls U2. With the, the two back together, that gives you a tensor. So, ah, so it didn't, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not showing the screen. I've got. Not sure if this is the screen. Maybe it's probably best section. Okay, so who's written that as five minus delta and delta. D2. So that's all for the but this is the sum from K equals K to two over Yeah, so in the last case one, right? Because we're dealing with that student. Yeah, 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 so case one. Uh, J, and then he's got J. So that's it. Okay, so his J is a trace. So actually, maybe. So, matrix goes in, takes a trace, it's a scalar, takes it to a matrix again. So that's a scale. So, I, I guess that's going to be interpreted as that. So this is two twelve fifteen in show for sure. Yeah, so this is the Yeah, yeah, no, no. Well, okay, so looking looking at it, um it's got a steady term and it's got this and no It's not simply looking at it, but it's going to show you. Yeah. So so that's I which takes a scalar and gives you the identity of the scale. So so I kind of go up and then it takes that. But anyway, yeah, the, the homework that we will do about Adams is to see what happens to scale, right? Because it should be the right answer. And so in strain stress terms, they like to think of the bulk strain, right? The isotopic strain, which we can get in the fluid. And the demotype strain, which is all the rest of it. 
And it's kind of interesting because deeply tight, like a great step, you know, like stretching it and symmetrically, um, or you know, rather than squishing it uniform, uh, it doesn't come to play. So deviatoric and isotropic bulb is a very useful kind of division, and it, it's kind of interesting that that comes up naturally. It's a natural orthogonal splitting of symmetric matrices, right? It's kind of actually comes from the um, character theory of the uh, of actions of groups. So it's got kind of canonical interpretation. Yeah, it is. It is. But but I think you should be a little bit careful because some people think that the non isotropic parts are. You know, maybe just squash things in three directions, but 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 of course, it's the extent to you know, to which you're not equally squashing it in three right. directions, right? So so the six components of a symmetric matrix, sorry, it's, um, six components of matrix is only um, uh, well, the, the symmetric matrix is the three things on the diagonal. And then six is symmetric. There's three on the diagonal and three that are not on the But amongst the three on the diagonal, it's only the trace of them that's like strong. It's some of So so it's kind of not just the off I know it's going to be saying not just the off diagonal it's anisotropic. But it's perfectly fair to call it the anisotropic part. When you remove the isotropic part. And so, you know, if you're thinking of a scattering radar and matrix radar cross sections all the way around, and, you know, it's a sphere, if you think you see it's isotropic, and then you say, take the best equivalent sphere, then you can fit it more measurements, and then subtract that response and put the anisotropic response. Right? So, it's kind of good that spirit. It's a few composing. And it's a, it's a little bit more complicated in, um, well, say, you know, in, in dimension three with high ranked symmetric tensors, but, but it's, kind, it's kind of understood in the same way with these spherical harmonics. So, in, in other words, there's a hierarchy of spherical harmonics, and there's zero if one is isotropic. Right? And then the, the next one that says the best fitting ellipses. And, and, you know, so that and there's five of those things. So somehow the extension is better to take a strong hormone because uh, that's the Okay, so the Reynolds transform. Um, uh, this is the back to jet then filter formula for that. So it's just there. So you can do the filter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the reason that's not so common is just because you need to do it 2D or I guess. Well, if doing it in the plane, you need to do a 2D for your transfer. That's not so bad in sense, but it used to be good to do. Okay, consistency conditions are very important. The same for every inverse problem are important. And in other words, knowing what is going best. And if you do the usual thing that most practical inverse problems do in most situations, which is to at least stress that you know, with a bit of regularization, then you kind of get the misfit for free. You know, you, you, you try to fit it the best you can, and you look at the residual, and you see some of got these values because some of the measures are bad. Or there's some pattern here, right? So if you're doing this, these best fitting type of things, you kind of get this information to show you that if you want to use an explicit algorithm like the back projection, then you're, you're less clear what it does. I mean, admittedly, the back projection step does have a big null space of invalid data, but it, it still takes the consistent error to fix it back in. And if you just do that, the information about the errors has just gone away when you back. 
So characterizing um, the range of the operator, it's confusing in radar sense, but it's not all the but mathematically it's also called the image, which would also be confusing in demography. So people generally think of consistency of data in, in that engineering world, but we are actually characterizing the range of an operator in the image of an operator in the background. So just be careful to translate between those because it could cause great confusion. And the best known are the Helvis and Ludwig range conditions. Actually, um, this is Helvig and Ludwig and Helvig and Ludwig and Helvig and um, often mathematicians would just say Helvig, but actually the Ludwig paper is really nice, easy range. <laughs> it's, it's actually, I mean, it's it's mathematically rigorous, but it's sort of just about the standard level of space. So, um, so it's probably why uh, a lot of people just call it Ludwig range. Okay, so we've got a radar transform. Now, what I've said is go a distance s along the direction side, which is what's inside of there, and then a distance t along the vector perpendicular. So, in other words, you go out to where the line is and then you go along the line. And then you spread it. So, that's just the normal radar transform. And then we take the moments. And so, in other words, you get each projection. So you can do this for each projection, for each bit of feedback the projection. You multiply S with an integral, just like you know, with the zero to the average, you know, you've got like, you know, you've got the mean and the values, so it's in that kind of spirit. In practice, uh, beyond about K, it's really just nonsense and real, real data, but no way, it really works. Um, so it turns out if you, if you do these integrals and get the moments, obviously they're functions of feet, but just functions of projection. Right? Um, so they're periodic functions. And if G was in the range of the so it was a random question, so it's a valid sign of it, then it turns out that it seems to be a function of theta, turn out to be polynomials and positive sign of theta. This was such a surprise. I mean, the periodic function has a Fourier series. Which is a sum of periodic functions, and they really don't bother with powers of sine as well as of sine density, which we need to go. And so the point is that the powers of sine and cos are no larger than the k that you took the moments of. So for k equals zero, this has to be constant, which just tests if something falling out takes away the one halfway round. If you check things, something puts something out, but same with green spot. Uh, and the higher one to determine more things that can go wrong that make your data inconsistent. Um, if you substitute S through the some angle, say sine of gamma, then you get S for gamma, which you can write in a Fourier basis. And, and so actually, the whole thing is just about Fourier components. So if you change the basis of the angle, write it as Fourier components, it's really about. Um, the frequencies in one of the variables always get an estimation of frequencies in the other variables. So you get the sine band of the right variables, two dimensional Fourier series in it, it's saying as a, as a table or something like that, that the triangle is consistent and the triangle is inconsistent. It's, it's like half the possible data actually is a valid sign band. I like to think, presumably, if you have sign of that means like this, you put it the wrong way around and it like that. So that would be inconsistent, right? But you just eyeball it and see you've just got the array the wrong way around. <laughs> like the readout from the camera. Not the very effects of Wi-Fi. Anyway. Um, so, so really, though, the, the thing about this whole thing with the brain condition is it measures isotropy. That's the point. And, and one way to be not consistent is to be not isotropic. How does this work? Well, if we can have something that's completely generally anisotropic, it's a function of x and theta. So the attenuation depends on which direction you're going, it depends on a scattering of the vacuum in the crystal, a radar scattering of the vacuum. And you can make that out if you actually want to. I mean, it might depend on scale, right? Because 
the crystal is an isotopic, but you can say, well, it's made of isotopic atoms. But you know, you can't dissolve that at level. And you know, we might we've got this little kind of corner effect. We can't sort of see the whole, you know, it's made out of isotropic bits, but as, as a whole, in the distance, it, it looks like an anisotropic bit. So it could be a question of scale. But um, we can do the long term very transform with that. The thing is, we just integrate x dot, you know, the thing that the, that the lines go over. So, so it's really just a function, at least point to a function on the circuit. So it's kind of like, so we can integrate that one to life. So that's closely related to the LR2 of the tensor field. All we need to do is expand the beta dependence as a as a Fourier series, and then we can call it a tensor when we have to stop the Fourier series. So obviously this one wouldn't have a detail space, you know, all the whatever all the gaps are that we find that. Yeah, this is sometimes called the geodesic X ray transform or the geodesic ray transform for reasons that are more mathematical. But. So I, I showed this guy in my workshop one talk. Uh, what a hero, uh, uh, especially a hero for optometrists, but he also got a Nobel Prize for face contrast microscopy, which I think was also pretty cool. Um, and so what he did is invent the symmetry disk functions. And, there's a picture, and you can see there are hierarchy of functions you get. You know, you can see that it's got higher frequency components as you go down, but it's also got a spatial variation. They have a basis for L2 functions on the disk. So the one orthogonal basis expands all the L2 functions on the disk. Um, they're made out of these real polynomials, um, which and you can just generate with these combinations of coefficients. And the Zernikis are these regular Zernikis functions times just a Fourier to basis. Numberings vary between different people. Um, and, and this is, but this is a kind of nice version using complex X plus I, Y coordinates. And so the numberings vary, but you can see when the numbers are going up, obviously, Z and Z point. They're not harmonic polynomials, obviously. Okay, so they're just nice family polynomials. And so Zernicke had an idea. He wanted to represent lenses for things. So he thought, well, what properties do I want? You know, and he said he's looking for eigenfunctions of operators like this, which are Laplacia. Plus, um, so this is. In its iterated uh, direction of the direction of X. Um, and so it, it's this not by the classic um, PDE on the disk, which has a nice forming color coordinates. And so these are the other functions of that. In fact, the are other functions of sort of two parts of it separately. And if you do it in color coordinates, they're obviously other functions of P2. By the angle squared because they're just big spaces in the angle. And then this is the regular part. Um, so actually, you know, like a matrix, if two matrices commute, they have the same eigenvectors. But you can still choose the eigenvectors, right? So you've chosen not by the eigenvectors. And uh, actually, you can mess with the constants to make the eigenvectors different things. And it turns out that this version, um, this minus the square root of this operator is R star R to the round, which you not widely appreciate, it, but it's it's not, but it, it's not, you know, it almost seems kind of accidental, but um, that means that this operator commutes with R star R. Which is which is kind of cool. It's, I mean the, the point is that uh, these are for you at the boundary. And you don't want something that's zero on the boundary, like uh, you use your, you know, spectral functions for the vibrations of the boundary, and you don't want, yeah. Okay. You can have that process, you don't want something that's just lazy. So I suppose the person to be, I think, you know, it's a pet sign. Um, 
You want to be in front of what's called kind of oh, something like this, I guess. His motivation wasn't very clear. It says what he was trying to do, but you know, you can see the the big you know, the angle part of that says why he thought I didn't want to do this because he didn't want to do this. I mean, he seems to have had some insight beyond what he said he was doing because the fact that a version of which that the scripts he promises is are the last art, you know, suggests that they're somehow you know, that have some kind of expression. Okay, so the range of the of the terms of external pieces, is, um, well, it, so the range in terms of Fourier basis is expresses one through this is equivalent of So that, that's how you see with the range condition. Um, and uh, the point is that um, Cousin set and book, uh, well, now the SCP of the long scale range transforming the process range condition from the one we will get. And it extends the scale of because they're going to get tensors. I mean, so actually, the tensors just got components that is in the functions in, in a kind of neat way. Because it's 2D, it lists the components of the tensor according to the following order. How many ones do they have in it? So for round two tensor, um, uh, well, I'll make it say how many twos. So this has got no twos, one two, and two twos. And it had lots of indices, but they were symmetric, so the order doesn't matter. I think the system is going to count the So it kind of makes it simpler for me this kind of text, which is like this one, for the double And then that's a list of zero twos. And it turns out that it's a very neat way to represent potentials in something because of the whole property of zero which I know I'm going to say. So the point is, this now introduces very nice options depending on the land of things that it gives. It's like having two of the points for certain lines. Um, and now if you look at the frequency of the land of the land of how much bigger they are tells you the rank pair of the field, or the order of Fourier series, which is me, you know, to bring in our software. So, um, you know, it, it means that we can apply a practical test to some data to, to see if it's anisotropic and if the anisotropy could be adequately represented by transitive certain Yeah, yeah, I, right, because in 3D, I don't know what they are allowed to see. That's great. But this is the value of my five, five, four, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, and it's a symmetric principle. You can, you know, the element here, just by saying terms of one, I can do this again, right? We can just sort of draw it. And that makes sense. I need to do it. 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 I have no idea what comes down to the answer to it. You know, what we now have is simply to do it. I mean, when you do have problems, one of the things you would like to have is to be the normal one that's going to be the same. So, we just have a tensor, we have a plane, and we calculate the normal, 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 you get things like components, and you break that into a tensor plane. So, you know, that might correspond to a few of you right now, but it would get you far more to the next sort of thing. So, um, I mean, Kevin Spet off a really nice paper on that, and they should be here by now, but I really just want to know it's so hopefully I'll get this one for You can do reconstructions with Zernikis. Um, either you can do it as a filter back projection, but you can also just do the truncate with SDD because you know the simple approaches. Um, it might not be the best thing to do. Um, uh, but I mean, you could do it as well. 
I just want to say a little bit about radar, which sort of refers to some reports we had before. But um, perhaps I should just uh, so we had a transmitter by a receiver, rational flying around on sort of planes and drones or whatever. And then we have um, a target here, which goes to three. And the radar goes from the transmitter. So see how you go through the travel time. Okay? The travel time is an ISO probe, which is an ellipse or a spheroid with a foci there. You know, maybe may remember my name. Yes, this is a script. Anyway, the, the point is, our scene is a small room here. Uh, we're flying a long way away, perhaps because it's some of the most beautiful So we want to be a long way away, and therefore we can take these two straight lines. So, so you know, the ellipses are lines that are turned left, turned left into ellipse, and that means. Um, the, the normal to these lines is the bisector of the lines from the transmission scheme. So you can call that average as a well, because the average is slightly varying. Okay. Um, so uh, this is the bistatic angle, beta. And I'm thinking, no, so I'm going to pick something. I'm going to pick a fine frame that I don't know the right one, but we want to take an additional one. Okay. So it's supposed to come all along at sort of a fixed angle to each other like this. I can put it on a very perfectly square area. But you know, this is just not seen. The point is that by seven angle is all in here. And so while the radar scattering cross section depends on the in and the out, so it's a function of two circles, um, let's suppose we fix the angle between the and the point of the line. And then we represent it as a full So if you see the angle, the angle is the average as which is just a very short. Then we could do it again with a receiver different distance away, if it's a different by seven angle. But in each one, we could reconstruct a solar magnetic tensor field that would represent the anastropical distance. Is this a good idea? I think it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, you, you could, in any case, just try and do a one place to try and put a clear on those tropic things of the sorts of things we know that arise to your radar data. But the interesting thing that the theory shows is that because the, the range is quite distinct depending on the frequency of the planes, the amount of our isopathy. Then it suggests that looking at the residue will, will tell you how I am to You know, a bit of pride edge, but you know. This is probably not here, even online, but it's probably living in Australia. Yeah, yeah. So, so, okay, so we can go that way. I mean, there's an obvious way to form it, right? We integrate over, over these types of ways. We've got a function of we can write it down, and what we expect to see is a similar kind of theory. I mean, in other words, we still expect to fly to more space because, in the limit, it reduces to this. So, yeah, I think it's been, I mean, it, it's strange if you imagine we've got something from the code. You, you will have no phase difference in the code, so that's an interesting thing because the code is going to give you a phase difference. But you know, things we don't actually know, but this modern problem we can analyze, and so we should just do it numerically and see if we get the right null space. If we don't, then well, that's really interesting. 
it's just like you know, the, the limitation of um, like so you could go like say I think it's a little bit of a defensive version of uh um spoiled or whatever that's one. Yeah, yeah. 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 But if you do it for several biosphatic angles, you still got the opportunity to match that to the signal for an object in this. You know, you might not be very much of the object, but it gives you characterization of the object. So you have a line going on. And then you actually know which biosphatic angles you're doing for finding the distinguishing between the things you're interested in. You can kind of imagine how that would work, you know, if they have one to three transformers, then they set everything back where they where, where it came from. And one of the would be great, right? But if there are different angles, then they tend to, it's like some particular angle of set because they're probably like a stout, you know, boat or whatever, with angles like this. And then, as we discussed, they send the rays back. In a particular angle to it, uh, then that's where you want to be the case, right? So that, that much we know. And um, because it's all a little bit fuzzy, it doesn't say that exactly, you know, in the top of the major theme there, but that's where you can get flat in the data. So that, that's the way we're going to go. I think we, in, in your lab, say, you can take your toy tank that you had and measure the hell out of it by standing the lead until you've got a complete. Understanding the price of HQ and scanning cross section, and then think about okay, what would be the best data to go with it and in you know, a time from the show or whatever it is that you get. So I have two two aperture's how long would it take to collect every possible population? Yeah. Five years scan. You're gonna have to get faster than you. You're gonna have to up your game. You're going to need some faster linear motors and all sorts. Yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, you could look for the sweet spot, right? I mean, you know, you, you can do a coarse, a coarse scan of it. And if you see the flash, then you can refine that to get a bigger flash. I think the point about it is as soon as you've got a very slow data composition, you've got a lot of time to think about perhaps all five of data. Right? So, if you're taking all the data is really, really expensive, then as you go, you think about, oh, wait a minute, where do I put the receiver next? Whereas if you've got a massive data system that just kind of generates terabytes of data at the press of a button, you know, then, then you kind of got to you reduce it afterwards. You've always got to start because measurement is small. That's right. So general general fiscal English problems say that when you have kind of overwhelming data, you can for example, only collect the data that is most informative, right? or you can get the data and kind of reduce it to more informative data, or, you know, and then you can very into planning ahead of what they can need or planning on the fly of what they can do. Yeah, that, that's generic across all kinds of here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.